The world around us is full of mixtures. Mixtures are different from compounds in that the molecules within mixtures are not chemically combined as in compounds, but rather physically mixed together. For instance, when we look at this granite, we can identify different types of mineral compounds within it, such as feldspar, quartz, and mica. All these minerals have their own individual chemical qualities. Blood is another example of a mixture. In our bodies, blood contains gases, such as carbon dioxide and oxygen, water and other liquids in the plasma, and solids in the form of minerals and blood cells. This mixture that makes up full blood can be separated into its component parts in a device called a centrifuge. Centrifuges are used by doctors and scientists to analyze the ratio of different components in the blood. The Earth's atmosphere is the mixture of several gases, one of which is oxygen. Unlike oxygen that is combined with hydrogen to form the compound we call water, the oxygen in the atmosphere is a free element and has all the properties that we associate with the element oxygen. For example, oxygen in the atmosphere supports combustion and respiration. However, when oxygen is combined with hydrogen to form water, it supports neither of these processes. Combining iron filings with powdered sulfur provides another example of a physical mixture. As we can see when we place a magnet next to the iron filings, the iron filings can be physically separated from the mixture and they maintain the magnetic qualities of iron. However, when we combine iron filings with sulfur to form the chemical compound iron sulfide, the iron loses its magnetic properties. Another difference between mixtures and compounds is that mixtures can have variable ratios, while compounds have fixed ratios. For instance, in H2O, or water, there are always two hydrogen atoms for every oxygen atom. However, when salt water is created, the level of salt can be increased or decreased relative to the amount of water. There are two basic types of mixtures, heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous mixtures. The properties of a heterogeneous mixture are not the same throughout the mixture. Trash is an example of a heterogeneous mixture. Its contents are not distributed evenly throughout the mixture. Another example of a heterogeneous mixture is this mixture of iron filings and sand at the Great Sand Dunes National Monument. As the concentrations of iron filings at various parts in the dunes vary significantly. Homogeneous mixtures are called solutions. Solutions have the same properties throughout. Solutions form when substances dissolve in other substances. The water coming out of your tap at home is a solution. It contains dissolved air and a variety of minerals. In any solution, the substance of which there is the greatest quantity is referred to as the solvent, while the substances of lesser quantity are called solutes. Solutes are dissolved in the solvent. Dissolved solute particles are either ions or molecules. Ions are atoms with either a positive or a negative charge. Ions and molecules are so small that they could not be seen with a typical microscope and can easily pass through filter paper. Solutes and solvents can be solids, liquids, or gases. Carbonated drinks, for example, have gas solutes dissolved in a liquid solvent. Vaporization, on the other hand, is an example of a liquid dissolving into a gas. The gas in a deep sea diver's tank is a solution of helium and oxygen gases. The addition of a solute to a liquid solvent causes the boiling point of the solvent to be raised and the freezing point to be lowered. For example, the salt water in oceans freezes at a lower temperature than does the fresh water in lakes.
The conductivity of a solution is affected by the concentration of solutes in the solution. Ionic solutes, like salt, and molecular solutes that ionize in solution, like hydrochloric acid, form solutions that conduct electricity when added to water. These types of solutes are known as electrolytes. The greater the concentration of electrolytes, the greater the amount of electric current that can be carried through the solution. There are also many molecular solutes, such as sugar, that do not form ions in solution and are referred to as non-electrolytes. Solutions containing non-electrolytes do not conduct electrical current. Pure water does not readily conduct electrical current, but one must be cautious when using electricity around tap water and seawater. Tap water and salt water contain numerous dissolved solids, some of which are electrolytes that conduct electricity. The concentration of solutes in a solution can be expressed in a number of ways. A saturated solution is one containing as much solute as can be dissolved in the solvent. If more solutes are added to a saturated solution, they cannot be dissolved into the solvent and settle on the bottom of the solution. The amount of a solute that a solvent will dissolve usually increases when the temperature of the solvent is increased. For example, much more sugar can be dissolved in warm tea than in iced tea. When sugar is added to water at high temperature and then allowed to cool, the solvent is then said to be supersaturated. The solvent now has more solutes than it would normally contain at the lower temperature. If more solute is added to a supersaturated solution, the molecules of the solute immediately begin to form crystals. Both rock candy and rock salt are both formed when more sugar or salt is added to a supersaturated sugar or salt solution. A large number of solutions are made up of solids dissolved into liquids, with water being a common solvent. Water is often called the universal solvent because so many materials dissolve into it. Yet there are some substances that are insoluble in water. For instance, motor oil will not mix with water. How readily a solute dissolves in a solvent is referred to as the solute's solubility. The rate at which a solute dissolves in a solvent, or whether it dissolves at all, depends on the molecular structure of both the solvent and the solute. The attraction atoms have for electrons varies. If two different types of elements combine to form a covalent bond, one element has a greater attraction for the shared electrons than the other. This gives the atom with more attraction a negative charge. The other atom in the combination has a positive charge. This slight variation in charges between the atoms gives them positively and negatively charged poles. Molecules that have poles are called polar molecules, which have poles comparable to those of a magnet or battery. Nonpolar molecules can be formed in two different ways. Some nonpolar molecules are formed when all the atoms in a molecule have an equal attraction to the shared electron such as in oxygen or in chlorine molecules. Other nonpolar molecules are formed because the structure of the molecule will not allow poles to form. For instance, in carbon chloride atoms, the chlorine atoms have a stronger attraction to the shared electrons than do the carbon atoms. But due to the structure of the molecule, there are no way for poles to form. All of the chloride atoms, which are negatively charged, are on the outside of the molecule surrounding the carbon atom. Solutes may also be polar or nonpolar. A polar solute will dissolve in a polar solvent, and a nonpolar solute will typically dissolve in a nonpolar solvent. As we saw before, a nonpolar substance such as motor oil will not dissolve in a polar substance like water. A general rule of solubility is that likes will dissolve likes.
We can see what happens when a substance dissolves in a solvent by looking at a salt crystal being dissolved in water. The salt crystal, which is composed of positive sodium ions and negative chloride ions, dissolves as the ions are surrounded by the polar H2O molecules. The positive sodium ions are attracted to the negative poles of the water molecules. Likewise, the negative chlorine ions are attracted to the positive hydrogen poles of the water molecules. The ions on the surface of the salt crystal disassociate from the surface of the salt crystal until it is entirely dissolved and the solution is completely saturated. There are a number of other factors aside from the polar and nonpolar properties of molecules that affect solubility. For example, as we discovered earlier, a warm solvent dissolves more of a solid solute than a cool one. However, the same is not true of gases in a liquid. Solubility of a gas in a liquid actually decreases as the temperature of the liquid increases. We notice, for example, that with carbonated beverages, the carbonation lasts much longer when the beverage is kept cold. The same is true of water. We see that bubbles rise towards the surface and escape the water as it is heated. Water from rivers and lakes is often used by industry as a coolant and then returned to the river or lake. Although the water is not polluted, it is hot. The hot water causes thermal pollution as it raises the temperature of a waterway. Thermal pollution decreases the amount of dissolved oxygen in the water and can dramatically alter the quality and quantity of plant and animal life within a lake or river. Pressure also affects the solubility of a gas. More gas can be dissolved into a liquid as pressure is increased. When you open a carbonated beverage can, the sound you hear is carbon dioxide escaping. Most carbonated beverages are bottled under pressure, and when opened, the pressure is reduced as some of the dissolved gas comes out of solution. Finer particles of a solute dissolve faster in a liquid than do larger particles. Stirring the solute rapidly into a solvent increases the contact of molecules and also causes solutes to dissolve more rapidly in a solvent. There are also a number of types of heterogeneous mixtures. These include suspensions, colloids, and emulsions. Examples of suspensions are readily found in nature. For instance, a sample of the water from a muddy stream would contain sand and sediment in suspension. If the material is allowed to sit, the sand and other particles will eventually settle to the bottom. Particles in suspension are thousands of times larger than molecules and ions dissolved in solutions. Suspended particles can be readily seen with the aid of a microscope. Some can be seen with the unaided eye. Suspensions can be made more stable by reducing the size of the dispersed particles through a process known as homogenization. Milk is homogenized by breaking down the suspended fat globules into smaller particles. This helps to prevent the separation of fat solids from the milk liquid. Suspension of solids in a gas can also occur. Often when we see the sun at a steep angle, we can see the dust and pollen suspended in the air. This is called the Tyndall effect, when the light is scattered by particles in the air. In our own blood, the blood cells are suspended in plasma and can be separated out with the use of a centrifuge. Likewise, many products that recommend shaking well are suspensions, where the particles within need to be evenly distributed throughout the liquid before it is used. Colloids are like suspensions, containing smaller particles than those in suspensions, yet larger than those dissolved in solutions. Emulsions, foams, and gels are examples of colloids. Particles in colloids are able to pass through filters and do not settle when left to stand. Colloid particles typically can be separated by a centrifuge. 
and the centrifuge spins very rapidly, it causes the substances to separate according to their density. Common examples of colloids are shaving cream and toothpaste. Emulsions are created by the use of emulsifying agents. When a combination of vegetable oil and water are placed in a jar, the two substances quickly separate into two distinct layers. When a small amount of soap is added to the mixture and the mixture is shaken, an emulsion is formed. An emulsion is a colloid created by the dispersion of one liquid in another. In this example, Soap is used as an emulsifying agent to combine the salad oil and water together. Soap molecules are large, and one end dissolves in the salad oil, while the other end dissolves in the water, thus bringing the two together. This is why soaps are so effective in cleaning grease, as they attach the grease molecules to them and are washed away by the water. Emulsifying agents are also used in foods, so they do not separate. Pectin is an emulsifying agent used in many jams and jellies. Eggs act as an emulsifier for the water and oil in mayonnaise. Often it is necessary to separate mixtures. One of the major differences between mixtures and compounds is that mixtures can be separated physically, while compounds can only be separated by chemical reactions. For instance, polluted water needs to be filtered before it can be used again. Water treatment plants have a variety of filters and settling tanks used for removing various substances from the water. Here, polluted water trickles over a filter of rocks and pebbles containing living bacteria that eat many of the suspended particles in the polluted water. A variety of filters are used in automobiles to remove particulates from the oil, gas, and air that are essential to the operation of internal combustion engines. Some materials can be separated from the mixture by using a magnet. Magnet separation methods are used in solid waste recycling plants where iron cans are separated from aluminum cans and other non-metallic materials on their way through the recycling process. The dissolved and suspended impurities of water can be removed through the process of distillation. Water is distilled by evaporating it, usually by boiling. The heated water is allowed to cool and condense into another container. The dissolved and suspended impurities are left behind in this process, leaving pure water in the other container. Crude oil is also turned into a variety of fuels through the process of distillation. Different hydrocarbons in the crude oil have different boiling points. For example, jet fuel has a much lower boiling point than asphalt. The distillation process also removes any mineral or other impurities from the crude oil pumped from the earth. Mixtures are all around us. The air we breathe, the water we drink, a variety of products we use, and the trash we create are all examples of mixtures. By understanding mixtures and their physical properties, we have come to understand an important part of how the world works.